welcome everybody. We'll wait just another 20 or 30 seconds as people join us. Thanks for being here. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jennifer Manukin, and I have the good luck of being dean here at UCLA School of Law, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that UCLA School of Law sits on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. As members of a land grant institution, we at UCLA pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives, past, present, and emerging. I want to welcome you to this latest installment in our From the Frontline virtual series. In these uncommonly challenging times, we're, we, we're lucky here at UCLA Law School to have faculty, alums, and friends who are among the foremost experts in the legal, social, and political issues that are at the heart of the current conversation. Nearly 50 years after the Equal Rights Amendment was sent to state legislatures to be ratified, the proposal may now have a chance to become law thereby guaranteeing equal rights under the Constitution, regardless of gender. Today, in celebration of Women's History Month, our extremely distinguished panel will take a closer look at the renewed push to ratify the ERA, the history behind the amendment, its promise, and what challenges might remain after ratification. I'm truly honored to introduce our panelists, panelists and our guest moderator. First, we're joined by Emily Martin, Emily is the Vice President for Education and Workplace Justice at the National Women's Law Center, where she oversees the organization's work advocating for equal treatment for women and girls in their places of work and schools. Previously, Emily served as Deputy Director of the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU, where she focused on advancing the rights of low-income women and girls of color. Welcome, Emily. Next, I'm delighted to welcome Catherine Spillar. Kathy serves as the Executive Editor of Ms. Magazine, and executive director of the Feminist Majority Foundation, which she co-founded. Kathy has dedicated her career to advancing women's rights both domestically and around the world. Before she worked in these dual roles, Kathy served four terms as president of the National Organization for Women's Los Angeles chapter. Welcome, Kathy. I'm very excited to introduce Professor Julie Souk, the Florence Rogatz Visiting Professor of Law and a Senior Research Scholar at Yale Law School, and a Professor of Sociology, Political Science, and Liberal Studies at the Graduate Center of the City University at New York. Julie is a nationally renowned expert on women and gender in the Constitution. Her recent book is titled, We the Women, The Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. And I think she's working on another book as well. And she also, uh, we had the honor of having her serve as a visiting professor here at UCLA Law School a few years ago. So welcome back to UCLA, Julie. Finally, I'm excited to announce today's guest moderator, Libby Denkman. Libby is the senior politics reporter for Southern California Public Radio, KPCC, as I'm sure many of you already know. And covers, she covers a wide range of political stories that impact our region. Libby, we are so delighted to have you and to be partnering with you on this important event. With that, welcome everybody, and I will pass, uh, pass the virtual mic to Libby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Manukin. I'm really excited about our panel today, and thanks to everybody who's tuning in for the conversation. Well, the effort to add the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution has been circuitous and involved some of the most influential women in the past century. And I have an amazing panel today to give us some context and update us on what's going on with the ERA. So let's dive in. I wanted to start with Julie Sook, uh, your book, the uh, We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment, it traces the history of the ERA over the course of more than 100 years, from the suffragette movement to the passage of the 19th Amendment up until today. Can you walk us through just a brief history of the bill up until the 1970s when it actually was sent to states for ratification? Great, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so the Equal Rights Amendment was initially introduced right after the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment was ratified. Uh, so in 1923, it was introduced, uh, and uh, Alice Paul, who is perhaps known as the most militant suffragist, uh, was one of the strongest proponents in the 1920s, uh, and for many years after. 
Uh, but she and um, other members of the National Women's Party, like Crystal Eastman, uh, really wanted a constitutional amendment that would guarantee women equal rights under the law in all domains uh, beyond the right to vote or in addition to the right to vote. Uh, and so um, the amendment uh, declared equality of rights not to be denied or abridged on account of sex. Um, the wording changed a little bit between the 20s and the 1940s. Uh, but as a general matter, it didn't really get off the ground initially. Uh, it didn't get off the ground initially because there were some concerns that um, this would require complete gender neutrality all the time. And there were some labor protections that actually helped working class women in factories and laundries. Uh, and those labor protections that were for women only were written in the context of a hostile Supreme Court, an all male uh, hostile Supreme Court, uh, hostile to labor rights. Uh, so because of these conflicts about um, labor protections for women, uh, it really didn't get off the ground. Uh, and there was some momentum in the 1940s, largely because of the UN Charter, specifically uh, declaring equality of rights between women and men, and many constitutions around the world written after World War II regarding equal rights for women as being kind of a staple of what it means to have a modern 20th century constitution. Um, so there was a little bit of momentum then, and the Senate passed some a version of the ERA uh, in 1950 and 53. Uh, but under Article 5 of the Constitution, you need two thirds of both houses of Congress. Uh, and we didn't get that uh, in the 1950s. And one very important explanation as to why the House never voted on it in the 1950s or 60s uh, was that the chair of the House Judiciary Committee uh, was an opponent of the ERA and wouldn't let it out of committee. Uh, and so by the time it actually gets its first vote on the House floor, uh, something extraordinary had to happen. Uh, and that extraordinary thing was Martha Griffiths, a Congresswoman uh, from Michigan, who spent several months uh, getting signatures on a discharge petition. It's a, an extraordinary parliamentary procedure by which you can wrest something out of the committee uh, and get it onto the floor for a vote, even if the committee doesn't report it out to the floor. Uh, and she did that in 1970. And uh, by the time when it got out on the floor, 96% um, of the House voted on it. Uh, and the version that they voted on did not have a seven year deadline on ratification. Uh, but then uh, it died in the Senate. Uh, again, there were many, many Senate supporters, well over 90% of the Senate, most likely even in that session supported it. Uh, but some of the opponents, um, I won't say they filibustered, but they um, used a lot of obstructionist delay tactics, tried to change um, some of the wording on the bill, tried to put in that seven year deadline. And so it never got a vote in the Senate. It died without a vote uh, in 1970. So then when the bill was reintroduced in 1971, uh, in part because of a fear of filibuster and to quiet some of the most vocal opponents who were really in the minority, uh, Martha Griffiths added uh, language to the preamble introducing uh, the, um, the ERA uh, that said um, that the article uh, would be valid as to all intents and purposes as part of the constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three fourths of the several states. Uh, and then that version passed, I mean, passed by well over 90% of the vote in the House, uh, passed by uh, well over 90% of the vote in the Senate. Uh, and that's when it went out to the states for ratification in 1972. And you said something interesting there in the earlier history of the bill, which is that, you know, at the time, labor organizations were against it um, because they feared that some of the protections for women that had been put in during the progressive era would be undermined by the Equal Rights Amendment. But then also that, you know, there were there was some more, uh, you know, conservative support, uh, you know, Republicans like I, Eisenhower supported it because they thought that it would eliminate those regu those regulations. I'm interested once it's actually sent to the states in the 70s, if you could explore a little bit of how it becomes this right wing uh, Christian conservative, uh, just lightning rod that it became when prior to that, I think there was more nuance in in how people address the, the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that really from the beginning, concerns about motherhood have always been part of the controversy about the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, because in the 20s, it was really um, social reformers who were concerned about working mothers actually, and the effects of industrial work 
on women's role in both biological and social reproduction. And so they thought they needed these labor protections, limitations on the hours of work uh, because uh, of women's maternal functions. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, many of the social reformers thought that men needed the protections too, uh, but they also knew that the Supreme Court uh, was not going to uphold labor protections for both men and women. So they were strategic about it. Uh, and so they didn't think that the US Constitution was really ready uh, for something that could be interpreted uh, by a conservative judiciary uh, to strike down uh, labor laws. Uh, and indeed, uh, this was a totally well-founded fear because in 1923, the year that the ERA was introduced, the Supreme Court did strike down minimum wages um, for women in a case called Atkins versus Children's Hospital. Uh, and the Supreme Court sort of referenced the 19th Amendment, said, uh, since women have the right to vote, uh, inequality of the sexes is ancient. It's coming to a vanishing point. Uh, and after that, some of the social reformers said that just protects women's right to starve. And if we don't want equality to be interpreted that way, we're going to need to get some women on the Supreme Court. Of course, we didn't get a woman on the Supreme Court for another 60 years after that. Uh, and so, but by the time, I mean, by the time you get um, through to the 1940s, uh, the Supreme Court shifts tremendously and upholds all the labor legislation for men and for women. So it becomes not much of an issue. Uh, the, the labor issue. Uh, and so by 1970, there's a grand, like bi bipartisan support uh, for the Equal Rights Amendment, including the Republican women. I mean, there weren't that many women in Congress, but the Repub all the Republican women supported it uh, in 1970 and 71. Um, and, um, and they supported it on the theory that uh, if women were mothers, uh, they would be disadvantaged, especially if they were widowed or single. Uh, and if they were homemakers, uh, their roles were denigrated because we didn't have equal rights uh, in our fundamental document. Uh, so in some ways they foresaw some of the concerns that ended up being used to tank the ERA uh, in the mid 1970s. So Phyllis Schlafly, who uh, launched a very um, effective stop ERA movement argued that if men and women were treated equally under the law, it would work to the disadvantage of mothers and wives uh, and women who are getting divorced. And, um, and she really exaggerated the extent to which uh, the Equal Rights Amendment would require a complete gender neutrality and unisex treatment in, in all matters. Uh, and it's also important to note that um, the ways in which the seven-year deadline uh, was used very effectively by the opposition. Um, the man who really insisted on the seven-year deadline in the Senate uh, closely worked with Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, and um, it wasn't just to raise opposition, it was to raise the kind of opposition that would be quite effective in uh, taking advantage of parliamentary rules in uh, the states uh, that would cause delays uh, on whether or not the bill got voted on at all. And so that seven year deadline is something I want to get to because it's a, a big obstacle that Congress is dealing with right now when it comes to reviving the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, you know, just briefly, th this is the point in the in the sev late 70s, early 80s, when the Equal Rights Amendment kind of grinds to a halt. There's 35 states that ratify, but they're not able to get to the 38 that's required to actually add it to the Constitution. Um, and let me bring in Kathy Spiller to the conversation, executive director of the Feminist Majority Foundation and executive editor of Miss Magazine, because, you know, you fast forward from when the ERA, you know, is is stymied uh, in the states at 35 states, that's late 70s, early 80s, and then 2017 rolls around. And suddenly Nevada ratifies and in 2018, Illinois follows. And then finally, you know, just last year, last January, Virginia becomes the 38th state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, as Julie Sook just mentioned, there is this deadline uh, obstacle that we're going to talk about in one moment. But uh, Kathy, can you explore why the ERA is suddenly catching fire in 2017, you know, four decades later? Well, let me add a little bit to what uh, Julie was saying, and it's the reason the ERA is still very much alive. And really, um, in the 50 years since uh, the Congress uh, passed the ERA, and even before that, uh, going out to the states, there's been a very active women's rights movement uh, that has never given up hope that the Equal Rights Amendment would become part of the Constitution. 
And even after 1982, when that time limit kicked in, uh, the movement never stopped. And it's the reason we did get Nevada and then Illinois and then Virginia. The, the dream of, of legal equality has always been a, a fiery uh, motivator within the feminist movement. Um, the, the reason Nevada suddenly flipped is, is the 2016 campaign there, uh, getting more women, more feminists elected to that state legislature. And it actually flipped uh, from being Republican controlled to being Democratic controlled. And um, a black woman senator there, uh, Pat Spearman, led the fight, but she had been a long time advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment, a long time advocate, but she saw her chance now that women had more power in the state legislature to get Nevada to ratify. And she was very familiar with the whole uh, concept called the three state strategy. We needed three more states after uh, the timeline kicked in in 1982. Uh, and so there was always this strategy that let's get three more states. So Nevada was the first to flip. Uh, Illinois in uh, 2019, but that movement in Illinois never stopped uh, from the uh, 1970s uh, when it was very active uh, working to get the Equal Rights Amendment ratified in Illinois. And Illinois put in a requirement for uh, amendment ratification of a two thirds vote of that state legislature, which is unusual. In most state legislatures, it's a simple majority vote. The speaker of the house there, a Democrat, Madigan was the reason that Illinois never ratified in the 1970s or early 1980s. Literally, uh, he kept it from going to the floor, uh, just like Julie was describing um, the activity in Congress. But he finally relented. Uh, why? Uh, the political power of women, having won the vote in 1920 um, and over the intervening years, had developed into a very potent electoral uh, tool. Um, and he could see the writing on the wall. One of his good friends in Congress was almost defeated by a woman's vote, uh, a woman running against him. And he was actually defeated in 2020. Um, and Madigan could see the writing on the wall. He was now endangered himself and his ability to control the Illinois House. So he relented and let the vote go to the floor. And then it passed. Um, and then in Virginia, that was the result of uh, massive campaigns over four years to flip that legislature from Republican control to Democratic control. Um, and then we get the Equal Rights Amendment ratified by Virginia. I, I want to add a little bit to what Julie was saying, because um, she focused in her book on the uh, legislators who have led the fight um, to get the Equal Rights Amendment as far as we have. But at the same time, there was this huge movement uh, that was very active. Uh, the, uh, the balconies in the Senate was filled with the RA supporters in 1972 when the Senate finally voted um, and to send it to the states. And immediately uh, the, the movement was already working in the various states to get ratification. You know, progress doesn't just happen. These, these legislators don't just suddenly decide that they're finally going to treat women as equals under the law. It takes campaigns and pressure tactics and uh, boycotts and threats of boycotts uh, and lawsuits um, and, and to get it to the next stage at every level. Um, and the opponents of the Equal Rights Amendment who are predominantly business interests, the Manufacturers Association always came out against the Equal Rights Amendment. The insurance industry, major, major opponents to the Equal Rights Amendment. They took out a full page ad in the Miami Herald at one point. Um, saying and, and what's the fear there? What, why are they particular insurance industries, business interests? They're overcharging women billions of dollars every year. Uh, they can no longer do that in health insurance because we got a provision under Obamacare that prohibits gender-based pricing for health insurance. Uh, but they were making billions in health insurance overcharges for women for less coverage. Now it's in annuities and life insurance policies and, and other uh, automobile insurance policies overcharge women uh, on average. And so they, they want to be able to use gender-based pricing, uh, which uh, some have argued because of the equal right uh, amendments reach nationwide and the insurance industry is heavily regulated at the state level, um, that they would come under uh, scrutiny. So it was always the manufacturers who underpay women um, to this day, the insurance industry, 
and, and other business interests. And Phyllis Schafly really was a front for the business interests who were opposed. They very cleverly used the issues that Julie raised about motherhood and, and um, they, they uh, raised all kinds of fear about um, uh, same-sex marriage, which we now have uh, without an ERA, um, same-sex bathrooms, uh, the, the military, now women are uh, able to, to go into every branch and every division in the military, um, but we still don't have an equal rights amendment. So many of the arguments that they use publicly to oppose and that Phyllis Shafley weaponized um, are no longer even valid. Uh, but uh, she really, she, she, was, she came late to the issue and in many ways was funded by the very corporate and business interests that opposed. Um, the vast majority of women uh, during the entire period and to this very day support the Equal Rights Amendment as do a majority of men and a majority of Republicans as well as Democrats, but not, not the elected um, because uh, the uh, too many Republicans now in elected office are, are the uh, captives of the business interests. And so they continue to oppose it. Uh, but, but we're at a point where it's so, such a huge movement and there's such momentum on our side that I do believe we're going to overcome this time limitation. Uh, it's always about bathrooms. Isn't it interesting that bathrooms become this kind of lever in a lot of these conversations, uh, you know, trans rights, uh, you know, is another obviously uh, situation where we're seeing that a lot. Um, let me bring into the conversation, Emily Martin, Vice President for Education and Workplace Justice at the National Women's Law Center. And Emily, Julie and Kathy have mentioned this obstacle that the proponents of the ERA are, are facing right now. And that's uh, you know, the fact that there are 38 states now that have ratified, but there was a deadline baked into the initial legislation that went through Congress in the 70s that has become this sticking point. Can you explain what's happening right now uh, and, and what Congress is trying to do to get around that? Yes. So, um, so right now there is an effort to retroactively revise that deadline and to uh, recognize the states that have ratified the era in the interim the house passed a resolution that would do just that um they did so last congress as well but last congress the senate under mitch mcconnell didn't take up that resolution. Here, there is a real opportunity to, to do so. And frankly, the legal questions that poses um, are, are brand new. It's not as though there's a ton of Supreme Court precedent out there about what happens when there is a deadline and then states ratify an amendment after the deadline and then the deadline is retroactively extended by Congress, but there is um, an important movement happening to, to reinvigorate the Equal Rights Amendment given the movement in the states that, that we've seen and that we have heard about, which is sort of of a piece with this broader, I think reinvigorated women's movement over the past several years that we've seen from, you know, from the Women's March to uh, to Me Too going viral, to women um, being elected in record numbers to Congress and to state legislatures, to the first woman vice president. Um, the, just as in the 70s, when the ERA first passed out of Congress, that wasn't instead of all the other things that were happening in the women's movement at that time. That was the same time that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was arguing and winning her cases challenging sex discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. It was the same time that statutes like Title IX were being passed out of Congress. That all of these movements build on each other in a way that um, can be incredibly powerful. And Emily, you know, I think about this very uh, esoteric argument about how to deal with the uh, the deadline. And maybe if uh, another one of our panelists also wants to jump in on this, there is a, a creative constitutional law interpretation that's going on. And that involves a precedent that 
was supposedly set by the 27th Amendment, which was added to the Constitution in 1992, um, which was 200 years after Congress first introduced it. Um, and I don't know if you want to address that or, or Julie or, or Kathy wants to jump in as well. But I mean, this is getting, you know, the, these are some, you know, very fundamental questions. And, and there's some very creative uh, observations happening to try to find a way to get this uh, past the past the sticking point. Yeah, fundamental questions and also fundamental questions about who the decider is of these questions. This is the Supreme Court that has the authority to decide whether and when an amendment has been properly added to the Constitution and whether Congress's deadline is um, binding and can be revised by Congress. Is it Congress that is the ultimate determinant of that process? But but I think Julie probably has even more to say. <laughs> yeah, Julie, go ahead. So the 27th Amendment, uh, which uh, regulates congressional pay, uh, was ratified in a 203 year period. It was written by James Madison himself uh, and adopted by Congress and sent to the states in 1789. In those days, they didn't put deadlines um, or time limits on ratification. So uh, when uh, the uh, 38th state ratified it, uh, it was recognized by Congress as being part of the Constitution and added to the Constitution. The practice of putting time limits really uh, went into being with the Prohibition Amendment, but the way in which deadlines uh, were put on constitutional amendments also evolved since then. Uh, the Prohibition Amendment deadline was obviously legally binding because they wrote it into the text of the amendment itself and they intended for the thing to die within seven years because they said shall be inoperative unless ratified within seven years. Uh, and then uh, the, they used that practice for several amendments though notably not for the 19th, there was no deadline on the women's suffrage amendment. Uh, the practice changed a little bit uh, in mid century where Congress started putting the time limit into the preamble. Uh, but for the 23rd and 24th amendments, they did that also with language that made it really clear that it was an expiration date. They said um, it's valid within seven years only if ratified within seven years, right? Uh, with the 25th and 26th amendment, as with the ERA, it went into the preamble and the language was much more ambiguous. It said, shall be valid when ratified in seven years, uh, which actually doesn't say it's an expiration date. It's just a date as to certain ratification if it happens within seven years. Uh, and it doesn't answer the question as to what happens if it takes longer than seven years. Uh, and I think that I read uh, as just textually as indicating Congress's intent to revisit uh, its calculation of the time that it thinks necessary for ratification. Uh, and that's consistent with the history because Congress did revisit it in 1978 and they extended the deadline once in 1978 uh, under this understanding that this language and the placement of the preamble uh, gave Congress the authority to do so. Uh, and, um, and that's what gives Congress the authority now, uh, many years later, uh, to change the deadline again, in fact, by just removing the deadline altogether and accepting uh, the 38 ratified states as sufficient uh, to constitute a fully ratified constitutional amendment. Kathy Spiller, I know just a couple of weeks ago, the uh, House again passed this extension on the deadline. Um, and now all eyes, of course, are on the Senate and, and what is going to happen there. I understand there is some effort to get some Republicans on board to try to get that 60 vote uh, threshold to overcome a filibuster. What can you tell us about what's going on in Congress? Well, there is a very active effort to, as you said, pick up those 10 votes in the Republican caucus that we're going to need because all 50 members, uh, Democratic members of the Senate um, uh, have signed on to support lifting the time limit. Um, two Republicans have signed on, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, uh, who is a co-sponsor of the resolution in the Senate and uh, Susan Collins of Maine. I think to get the next eight, I, I think almost defies any effort. Uh, there, uh, there may be a couple more who come on. Um, I think if it got to the floor, uh, you'd see more people pile on very quickly because uh, the last thing I think uh, electeds wanna do right now is alienate women more than the Republican party already has. Uh, 
Uh, it's uh, the gender gap, women's votes that are uh, elected uh, this president, President Biden uh, and Kamala Harris, by the way, very strong supporters of the ERA, both of them. Um, and uh, of course, it's what flipped the Senate, uh, especially among black women in Georgia, uh, the showing there um, uh, among women in general, but black women in particular, uh, took the control of the Senate out of Republican hands. I think that what we are facing is what the Voting Rights Act uh, are facing, H.R. 1 and, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and what immigration reform and what um, uh, the kinds of investments in our infrastructure that we're going to need, uh, we're all facing the same problem, and that's this filibuster, which is, a, um, as Biden recently uh, said, you know, is a holdover from the Jim Crow era. And so I think that what we're seeing is a real movement to um, end the filibuster um, so that these kinds of pro progress oriented efforts um, can actually get through the Senate. Uh, and, I, and I think that that is uh, where we're headed definitely. You know, let's let's put a, a bookmark in that because you know filibuster reform obviously is a is a huge question, and it's going to be required, as you mentioned, to accomplish a lot of what Democrats are hoping to get through in this Congress. Um, Emily Martin, can you uh, discuss the practical implications of the ERA? Like, what happens? if there is movement in Congress, if the ERA is ratified and added to the Constitution tomorrow, what kind of practical changes or um, you know, legal uh, parameters could we see change with that uh, addition? Well, first, I think that it makes a practical difference when our foundational document um, recognizes gender equality as a foundational principle. The, that um, in and of itself as sort of a national statement of who we are and what we believe is important both for its own weight and because, um, because it, it supports and, 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 and solidifies this many decades long movement and the current push for gender equality in ways that are really profound. Um, I also think that one reason the Equal Rights Amendment is important is because by strengthening the Constitution's protections against sex discrimination, it provides a more robust basis for, um, for recognizing that the Constitution protects against discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, on the basis of childbearing, on the basis of caregiving, questions where at best the law is ambiguous right now, um, where there is precedent from the 1970s saying pregnancy discrimination isn't sex discrimination under the constitution. Now the Supreme Court has com complexified that a little bit in the decades that have followed. But um, I think that that's one reason why the Equal Rights Amendment would be really important. It would um, provide a much stronger basis for those arguments, which really go to sort of core gender inequities that continue in our society today. Another reason why the Equal Rights Amendment would be really important follows from the Supreme Court's decision in the Bostock case last year, which recognized that sexual orientation discrimination and gender identity discrimination are forms of sex discrimination. And so having explicit, clear constitutional protection against sex discrimination would provide newly robust protections against sexual orientation discrimination, against discrimination against transgender people, which is critically important right now. We're seeing, you know, just this week, a wave of state legislative efforts to, for example, deny health care to transgender youth, to ban transgender youth from participating in athletics. Um, so those are some of the places where um, the Equal Rights Amendment has a real impact to make, and in some ways, I think would speak directly to fights that we're literally having today. Julie Sook, uh, your book, We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. Just want to make sure I let everybody know about the book and, and they can read so much more about this there. Um, you know, I hear the arguments. I hear, you know, the 14th uh, Amendment and its Equal Protection Clause already covers what is needed uh, out of the ERA. Um, you know, what what is your 
response to folks who say it would just be a symbolic move? Well, there's a process by which the ERA has been made over time, uh, which is to say that it was adopted by Congress in 1972 and then um, ratified throughout the 70s and then continued to be ratified in the 21st century, which means there's a long window by which we talk about what it could mean uh, and its interaction uh, with both the triumphs and the limits of sex equality law under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, there are two provisions of the ERA that uh, get less attention than the equality of rights uh, provision. Uh, what the, section two gives Congress the power to enforce the ERA, in, enforce what it means to have equality of rights unabridged on account of sex. Uh, and section three creates a two year delay on ratification. And people might be curious about that two year delay because you don't see a two year delay on other constitutional amendments. Uh, the last time we saw something significantly similar was the prohibition amendment, which had a one year delay. Uh, and uh, the intent of that one year delay was similar to the intent of the two year delay on the ERA, which is that with prohibition, people expected um, some serious legislative change to make prohibition real. Uh, they, they wanted uh, both Congress and state legislatures to enact laws. Uh, and it's the same with the ERA. Uh, in the 1970s, the lawmakers who were proponents of the ERA on the floor, uh, they really saw this not just as an amendment that they would hand over to the Supreme Court to interpret, but an amendment that legislators would use. Uh, so uh, the fact that they were doing ERA at the same time as comprehensive childcare legislation uh, for which there was bipartisan support, unfortunately vetoed by uh, Nixon. Uh, but the fact that they were doing it together, it was part of one organic conversation, uh, child care, Title IX, educational opportunity, uh, and uh, refinements to the equal pay laws that were already there, uh, which targeted not just governmental discrimination, but discrimination uh, that women faced in society, often connected to uh, the fact that they were mothers or mothers-to-be or perceived to be mothers or mothers-to-be. Uh, and a lot of this legislation, it's not, so the things that we're talking about, things like equal pay or pregnancy discrimination by big corporations, it's not going to be directly made illegal the day that the ERA goes into effect, uh, but these are things that Congress would probably have a strong reason, if not an obligation uh, to deal with uh, under section two of the ERA. And I think this robust understanding of Congress's power to really do something about gender equality is extremely important now uh, because of the female recession. Uh, we have been set back so far uh, in terms of women's progress in the labor market that without really robust national public policies, it's not really clear uh, whether uh, some of those effects will be reversed. At the same time, we've had Supreme Court jurisprudence since the 1990s that have significantly limited Congress's power uh, to regulate under the Commerce Clause, under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. We're seeing new litigation just cropping up this month, challenging some aspects of the American Rescue Plan uh, based on a potentially very limited understanding of Congress's spending power. Uh, so these are all things where it's at best ambiguous as to whether Congress has the full toolkit to really attack the complex dynamics of gender inequality um, using the powers it already has under the Constitution. And ratifying now, even though the language, the language doesn't say, uh, is not highly detailed, but I think the moment and the movement and the process can be um, an indication uh, that the ERA is intended to actually uh, overcome uh, some of these limits that the Supreme Court has set uh, on Congress's national power to deal with inequality. Kathy Spiller, can you also comment on, you know, this argument that the 14th Amendment is is there for equal protection and it's the ERA would be just a symbolic move. Well, um, not being an attorney, uh, but uh, understanding there is a difference between um, strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny. And I, I think, uh, I defer to my uh, colleagues on this call who are lawyers that uh, the 14th amendment has never been applied to sex discrimination uh, at the level of strict scrutiny, uh, which race is um, evaluated in that way, race discrimination. Um, and so uh, adding it to the constitution would up the uh, scrutiny that uh, laws would uh, and situations would be subject to review by the Supreme Court and by other federal courts, of course, 
Well, uh, I actually, I, I think we should hesitate about strict scrutiny uh, because the proponents in the 1970s wanted strict scrutiny when strict scrutiny was the way that you attacked Jim Crow. In the late 1980s, strict scrutiny became the way that you attacked race-based affirmative action. Uh, and that became the primary doctrinal tool uh, by which the Supreme Court was able to strike down a lot of race-based affirmative action. But that's the problem uh, that's with the court. Why, <laughs> that's precisely why in United States versus Virginia, uh, the uh, Just Justice Ginsburg is very careful uh, not to apply strict scrutiny to sex classifications, but rather uh, something that she calls skeptical scrutiny, which is a version of intermediate scrutiny uh, that allows uh, distinguishing between men and women uh, when necessary to overcome women's uh, disadvantages, economic disadvantages, uh, but uh, prohibits uh, the, the different treatment of men and women when it perpetuates women's second class citizenship or perpetuates gender stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we want to say now that the whole point of this is to get a strict scrutiny applied to sex classifications. And in fact, uh, the beauty of doing the ERA now is to say maybe the doctrinal categories that were created to think about equality under equal protection in the race context mm -hmm. are not the best ways of thinking about it, not only for sex, uh, but also for race classifications as well. So there could be a feedback loop by which new ways of thinking about um, discrimination uh, that are not tethered to these older doctrinal categories can emerge out of the ERA and might even be helpful eventually for rethinking uh, the 14th Amendment jurisprudence. Well, uh, and, and there are different approaches. If you look yeah. at constitutional courts that do equality around the world, there are many approaches that are not strict scrutiny um, that might be better at getting at this space between allowing some forms of positive action to promote equality uh, while prohibiting uh, the forms of uh, sex distinction or race distinction that actually perpetuate inequality. Right. Julie, I would argue some of that is the problem of the court. I mean, we have had a Supreme Court that has moved steadily to the right uh, with uh, some originalists um, on the court now who, if they uh, mimic what uh, Scalia said, uh, has been very clear that you know the Constitution doesn't prohibit sex discrimination. So I would argue some of it, and, and we have fought long and hard for affirmative action, um, that uh, some of it is is a problem with the way the the courts have come down, but I I defer to your analysis on that. What I would say though to add to it is that even if the only jobs and uh, practices that were impacted at the end of the day by the Equal Rights Amendment was what the federal government did and what the state government and what local governments did, they're the largest employers in this country across the board. They're the largest source of contracting. Um, they have huge economic impact um, on women's lives or government programs that still treat women differently than men. Social Security, for example, uh, is, is discriminatory in the way that it deals with uh, women, especially uh, women who are not in the paid labor force, totally uh, not valuing uh, the uh, economic contributions that women make in caregiving. Um, and so you end up with a zero on your uh, social security record for every year you're not in the paid labor force, uh, which ultimately impacts um, your retirement, your, your benefits when you do retire. So I think there's all kinds of ways that even if the ERA doesn't get to everything that uh, the original proponents might have argued for, I think it can have enormous impact um, in setting the pace for, for pay, for uh, uh, pay equality, um, for job classifications, all of all of that, which impacts uh, women's earning power. So, and certainly the provision of uh, childcare um, and the caregiving whole infrastructure um, and the way our taxes are, the way the spending is handled. Right now we're in the feminist movement writ large, including the National Women's Law Center is playing a very big role in this is arguing that the next recovery package has to fund childcare and caregiving as part of our nation's infrastructure that supports our economy. Uh, we can't just think of hard hat jobs, uh, building roads and high-speed rail. We have to think about uh, the caregiving economy, which um, is, is another way that the federal government makes distinctions, um, not straightforward, but in reality, the majority of construction workers are men to this day, and the majority of child care providers are women. Um, so the, many decisions that the federal government makes in its budgets and its practices 
uh, will impact our lives uh, very significantly. Well, I, for one, am glad that our audience is uh, primarily law school uh, uh, students and grads <laughs> so that we can, uh, you know, not have to translate the strict scrutiny argument that um, that we just had there, not argument, but a exchange of ideas. Um, and I really appreciate, you know, the kind of diving into that that issue. Um, I did want to bring in Emily Martin because, uh, you know, Kathy touched on modern gender discrimination and, and what that looks like in our lives. Can you discuss further, you know, the, the ERA is something that would be a tool to address these issues, but what are the issues that, uh, that people should be aware of and how does mon modern gender discrimination play out in our daily lives? Well, I'm really glad that, that Julie and Kathy have helped sort of frame the current COVID moment in which we find ourselves in this discussion of gender equality, because one of the things that the pandemic and the resulting recession have really done is sort of shown a light on the gender and the racial fissures that are really um, leading to greater inequality in this moment. Um, you know, since COVID hit, uh, well over 2 million women have left the workforce entirely. Um, half of those women are Black and Latina. Right now, women's workforce participation is at the lowest rate since 1988. So we've really lost a generation of gains. And that's for a variety of reasons. But one reason is because this has been a moment when our caregiving infrastructure has collapsed. And so as families are trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that um, their kids are not in school and their childcare centers are closed or reduced capacity or just don't feel safe, that um, more often than not, it is women who make the sacrifice to step in and, and fill that breach. Um, we also know that women are a significant majority of those who are in the lowest paid jobs in the country. That was true before the pandemic, but that means when the pandemic came and had especially heavy impacts on those jobs, we've seen the biggest numbers of job loss in the lowest wage occupations that, that women, and in particular women of color, were really disproportionately represented in that job loss. So, so that is both a reflection of the gender inequities that led us to this point, to the occupational segregation, to the, um, to the, to the heavy caregiving responsibilities and burdens, as well as to sexism and racism that continue in the economy and in employers' decisions. Um, and that now the current crisis really threatens to worsen for not just months to come, but years to come since time at, out of the workforce, time unemployed tends to lower your wages when you go back to work, that there's really a possibility that we'll see race and gender wage gaps actually growing in the years to come after many years of very slowly, slowly shrinking. So, so that's sort of a backdrop when we're thinking about what what do we still need to do to, to get to gender equality in this country? We need to think about caregiving supports, about accommodations for pregnancy, about um, ensuring that um, occupational segregation is uh, that women are no longer harassed and forced out when they're going into traditionally male higher paying occupations and also that when a job is primarily done by women, that that doesn't mean that we pay it less. So strengthened equal pay protections um, that look across jobs as well as within jobs. Um, that's some of the backdrop that I think it's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about what does gender equality look like and what do we hope that the ERA um, allows for and spurs and shapes when we are imagining, um, you know, the world in which in the two years after ratification, state legislatures and state governments and Congress are thinking about, okay, now that we have made this national commitment, what does gender equality look like and how do we, what do we need to do to get there? Uh, just because we have about 10 minutes left here, and I, I want to make sure we we talk about this issue, uh, Julie Sook, 
uh, Kathy Spiller mentioned that, you know, legislators who are women of color really led the charge in uh, the states they ratified recently, especially Senator Pat Spearman in Nevada, who is, um, you know, a, a woman of color and also an, a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on whether this push or maybe the, the, the push over the last couple of decades for the ERA is becoming a more inclusive movement. Um, is, is that the case? Is that because uh, members of the movement right now are more visible by POC women? Um, and what kind of work still needs to be done on that front in terms of inclusivity and diversity of, of these movements? Well, I wanna clear up any misunderstanding um, about ERA being non-inclusive because in the 1970s, uh, one thing I focus on in my book is the role that the first women of color in Congress played in advocating for the ERA on the floor. Uh, and I would argue that Patsy Takamoto Mink, the first Asian American woman in Congress and Shirley Chisholm, the first African American woman in Congress, they weren't the sponsors of the bill uh, but they gave these speeches that really gave it the intellectual architecture and the legal architecture uh, that I've been describing, really thinking about Congress's role uh, and legislation enforcing the ERA being not just about getting rid of gender classifications, but addressing the kinds of things Kathy brought up, looking for disparate impacts that some of the policies that we have um, might address. Uh, and so they, uh, I, I think we need to give them credit uh, for, for those contributions. And I think the ERA that's now being ratified uh, was always attuned to the concerns of women of color. They brought up the fact that women of color often worked because they didn't have a choice to. Uh, and so they were primarily concerned with the economic insecurity of mothers and working mothers. Uh, and, um, and certainly Barbara Jordan uh, in 1978 gave some beautiful speeches uh, during the deadline extension uh, floor debates uh, and she was a brilliant constitutional law uh, scholar uh, in many respects. Uh, so she gave the deadline extension a certain intellectual architecture during those uh, floor debates. And a lot of it also had to do with the structural uh, problem of making an amendment under our founders rules in Article 5. Uh, two thirds of Congress, both houses, uh, right now uh, we have, we're at a record high of women in Congress and that's 26%. But that's not even enough. You would need 33% of women to block a constitutional amendment, let alone make one. You know, So I think we need to be more aware of the way in which our amendment process uh, has made it nearly impossible uh, for people who seek their inclusion uh, to get it done at all, let alone within seven years. Uh, and, so, uh, and so, yeah, now there are uh, record numbers of women and women of color in state legislatures. Uh, and so they've come 40 years late uh, with their ratifications. Uh, but I think the fact that it is women of color who were not in the state legislatures in these numbers 40 years ago uh, when the ERA was uh, within that time limit, uh, but they've now done it uh, and it's taken a hundred years largely because of the design of our constitution makes inclusion so hard. Uh, I think these are all things that Congress can take into account as a political matter and should take into account as a political matter in exercising its authority over the timeline. Kathy Spiller, can you jump in here? We have five minutes left, so I want to start getting to kind of final thoughts. Um, first, you know, jumping off of the inclusivity of the movement and really making sure that we honor the women of color who, as uh, Julie has mentioned, have been there, you know, for since the beginning, uh, really helping to push this through. Um, can you comment on that? And then also just sort of your final thoughts that you want to make sure people go take away from this conversation? Well, Julie's absolutely right. Uh, uh, women of color and women as a whole have been the real leaders in this entire movement, um, whether elected to office or on the streets, uh, black sororities have been heavily, heavily uh, working for the Equal Rights Amendment um, since it came out of Congress. Uh, Latina sororities um, more recently joining the movement. Uh, so I, there's been, there's no question that women of color understand discrimination uh, doubly um, because they face both race and sex discrimination and understanding how those intersect. Um, and, uh, and they have been some of the most significant proponents, including Martin Luther King's wife. Uh, Coretta Scott King was a major, major advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, 
men have been with us the entire time, uh, mostly because they, were, they are still uh, the majority of uh, Congress and the majority of most state legislatures. I think Nevada is the only legislature in the country that is a majority women in both houses. Uh, so it's, it's been the political empowerment of women since we won suffrage um, that has brought us this far. And I, and I think we're so close to, to seeing it get over the finish line. And, and um, Julie makes a very powerful argument that it really is a political decision on what to do about this time limit. Congress has the authority and we're pushing them to exercise that authority. And, and especially in this period where it's been women's votes uh, that have delivered uh, the democratic majorities in both the Senate and the House and for this presidential uh, administration. So a um, hundred years is a long time to wait. Uh, I would argue it actually goes all the way back to um, when the, uh, 1776, um, it was, um, uh, oh gosh, John Adams' wife, Abigail Adams, who said, you know, we're going to foam in a rebellion if you leave us out. And they left us out. Um, but we are finally on the cusp of uh, being added in. And people can, this is the time where if you haven't been active before, it's the time to get active. Um, and uh, go to erayes2021.org and, and join this movement, get Julie's book so you understand how we got here and, and um, be part of getting it over the finish line. Oh, and we just got a request in comments to mention Julie's book again, so I'm not gonna hesitate on that. It's called We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, you know, Emily Martin, just quickly, your final thoughts. We have about 30, 40 seconds, and then I wanna finish with Julie, uh, go ahead. My final thought is that, you know, those 38 states that have ratified, they should move forward as though the ERA were part of the Constitution. Let's start our two year clock for sort of a, a close examination and conversation in those states about what do we need to do to get to gender equality. Virginia passed uh, new protections against pregnancy discrimination and um, LGBTQ discrimination and, and sexist and racist school dress codes the same year that they ratified the ERA. That should be a model for policymakers around the country. Thank you, Julian. Can you bring us home with your your takeaways and what people should should know going forward? Yes, absolutely. So I just want to remind everyone that the text of the ERA has a lot of concepts in it uh, that are very abstract. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Uh, and so all of the things that we've been talking about today about what it could do are just possibilities. Uh, but uh, they, if a judge interprets uh, without those possibilities being made clear, uh, the judges can interpret very differently. They could interpret in a way that leads to no affirmative action for women. They could interpret in a way, you know. So uh, I think that the, the antidote against those kinds of judicial interpretations is the creation of more legislative history. Uh, and this is why I think it's so important, whether uh, in whatever public venues uh, um, available, but certainly ones in Congress, I think the opportunity to remove the deadline is an opportunity to make 21st century, 2021, post-pandemic meaning of gender equality. And so I'm hopeful that there will be hearings uh, at every opportunity in Congress uh, to move it forward, uh, because I think without them, uh, we may be surprised by the way that the judiciary chooses to interpret the ERA, even if it does become part of the constitution. Thank you so much to all of my panelists. A genuinely just fascinating and, and wonderful conversation. Julie Sook, legal scholar and author of the book, We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. Kathy Spiller, executive director of the Feminist Majority Foundation and executive editor of Miss Magazine, and Emily Martin, vice president for education and workplace justice at the National Women's Law Center. And thank you to the UCLA School of Law for having me. My name is Libby Dankman with KPCC, your public radio station here in Southern California. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.